13, in poor quarters. In the meantime, the Hardy boys were finding the suspense almost unbearable. They had expected that their father would be away but a day at the most, but when two days dragged by, then three, and finally an entire week, without word from Mr. Hardy further than a brief note from New York stating that he was well and that the case was not as easy of solution as he had hoped, they became depressed. If dad can't get the thief, no one can, declared Joe, with conviction, and I'm beginning to think that even dad is falling down in this affair. Better wait till he admits it himself, suggested Frank. Although I don't mind telling you I'm not very hopeful myself. Frank's preoccupied air had not gone unobserved. Callie Shaw had noticed his abstraction. More than once, when she had smiled pleasantly at him as they met one another in the hallways or in the classroom at the high school, he had merely nodded moodily. Callie was too sensible to be hurt by this, but she wondered what was worrying Frank. So one afternoon, when they happened to leave school together, she taxed him with it. What's on your mind, Frank? she asked gaily. You've been going around looking like a human thundercloud for the last week. Who, me? I didn't notice, returned Frank heavily. Yes, you, she replied, mimicking his lifeless tone. You used to be full of fun. What's the matter? Can't I help? She glanced up at him eagerly. Frank shook his head. No, you can't help, Callie. It's about Slim. Slim Robinson. Oh, yes. Wasn't that too bad, said Callie, with quick sympathy. He had to leave school. They tell me he's working. In a grocery. And he was so anxious to be a lawyer. I was talking to him this morning. He pretends he likes the work he's at, but I could tell he wishes he could get back to school again. I'm real sorry for him. And all on account of that confounded tower robbery. But nobody really believes Mr. Robinson did it. Of course not. Nobody but heard Applegate. But until they find who did take the stuff, Mr. Robinson is out of a job and nobody will hire him. Isn't that too bad? I'm going over to see Paula and Tessie and Mrs. Robinson tonight. Where are they living? Frank gave Callie the address. Her eyes widened. Why that's in one of the poorest sections of the city. Frank, I had no idea it was that bad. It is and it'll be a lot worse unless Mr. Robinson gets work pretty soon. Slim's earnings aren't nearly enough to keep the family yet. Isn't there any chance that Mr. Robinson will be cleared? That's what's worrying me. Dad is working on the case. Then why should you worry, said Callie triumphantly. Why, that means it'll be all cleared up. Your father can do anything. I used to think so, too. But he seems to be stuck, this time. What's the matter? He went to New York almost a week ago with some clues that Joe and I were certain would clear up the affair, and so far we haven't heard from him, only to know that the case was harder than he expected. But he hasn't given up, has he? Well, no. Then what are you worrying about, silly? If your father had given up the case there would be something to worry about. If he is still working on it there's always hope. They walked on in silence for a while. Let's go out to see the Robinsons, Callie said suddenly. I've been intending to go, but I sort of, well, you know. You thought it might embarrass them. Well, it won't. I know Paula and Tessie well, and they're not that kind. They'd appreciate a friendly visit. Frank hesitated. He had the natural shyness of his age and he felt awkward about visiting the Robinsons in their new home, for he knew they were now in reduced circumstances and might not wish their former friends to see them in their present plight. But Callie's words reassured him. All right. I'll go. We can't stay long, though. We can't. I must be back in time for supper. 
We'll just drop in on them so they'll know we haven't forgotten all about them. I thought you were going over to see them tonight. I was, but I've changed my mind. I want you to come with me now. Frank hailed a passing streetcar bound for the section of the city in which the Robinsons lived and they got on board. It was a long ride and the streets became poorer and meaner as they neared the outskirts of Bayport. It's an outrage, that's what it is, declared Callie abruptly. Mrs. Robinson and the girls were always accustomed to having everything so nice. And now they have to live away out here. Oh, I hope your father catches the man that committed that robbery. Her eyes flashed and for a moment she looked so fierce that Frank laughed. I suppose you'd like to be the judge and jury at his trial, eh? He chuckled. I'd give him a hundred years in jail. When at length they came to the street to which the Robinsons had moved they found that it was an even poorer thoroughfare than they had expected. There were squalid shacks and tumble-down houses on either side of the narrow street, and ragged children were playing in the roadway. At the far end of the street they came to a small, unpainted cottage that somehow contrived to look neat in spite of the surroundings. The picket fence had been repaired and the yard had been cleaned up. This is where they live, said Frank. It's the neatest place on the whole street. Paula answered their knock. Her face lighted up with pleasure when she saw who the callers were. Frank and Callie, exclaimed the girl. You've come to see us. Come in. We're dying of loneliness. There hasn't been a soul out this way since we moved. Callie flashed Frank a look of triumph, and whispered. There, now. Didn't I tell you they'd be glad, as they went into the house? They were greeted with kindly dignity by Mrs. Robinson and with girlish good humor by Tessie. Mrs. Robinson received them with the same self-possession she would have shown had they been back at Tower Mansion, and Frank wondered at himself for thinking that these good people might be ashamed to meet their old friends in this new and humbler home. We can't stay long, explained Callie. But Frank and I just thought we'd run out to see how you all are. We're all well, that's one mercy to be thankful for, answered Mrs. Robinson. Perry is working. I suppose you knew that. And Mr. Robinson, inquired Frank. She shook her head. Not yet. Mrs. Robinson's lips quivered. It's so hard for him, she said. Without a recommendation, you know. It looks as though he might have to go to another city to get work. And leave you here? I suppose so. We don't know what to do. It's so unjust, flared Paula. Papa didn't have a thing to do with that miserable robbery, and yet he has to suffer for it just the same. Has your father discovered anything yet, Frank? asked Mrs. Robinson hesitantly. I'm sorry, admitted Frank. We haven't heard from him. He's been away in New York following up some clues. But so far there's been nothing. Of course, it isn't often he falls down on a case. We hardly dare hope that he'll be able to clear Mr. Robinson. The whole case is so mysterious. I've given up thinking of it, Tessie declared. If it is cleared up, all well and good. If it isn't, we won't starve, at any rate, and Papa knows we all believe in him. Yes, I suppose it doesn't do much good to keep talking about it, agreed Mrs. Robinson. We've gone over it all so thoroughly that there is nothing more to say. So, by tacit consent, the subject was changed, and for the rest of their stay Frank and Callie chatted of doings at school. Mrs. Robinson and the girls invited them to remain for supper, but Callie insisted that she must go. When they left they promised faithfully to pay another visit in the near future. Only once again was the subject that was nearest their hearts brought up, and that was when Mrs. Robinson drew Frank to one side as he was leaving. Promise me one thing, she said. Let me know as soon as your father returns if he has any news. I'll do that, Mrs. Robinson, agreed the boy. I know what this suspense must be like for you. It's terrible. 
But as long as Fenton Hardy is working on the case I'm sure that it will be cleared up if it is humanly possible. And with that, the matter rested. Callie was unusually silent all the way home. It was evident that she had been profoundly affected by the change that the Tower Mansion mystery had caused in the lives of the Robinsons. Naturally sympathetic and tender-hearted, she felt keenly the injustice of it all, and she realized even more than Frank what it had meant to Mrs. Robinson and the girls to move from their comfortable home in the mansion to the squalid and distant part of the city in which they now lived. Callie lived but a few blocks away from the Hardy home, and Frank accompanied her to the gate. Mercy, she exclaimed, glancing at her watch, it's after six. I'm away late for supper. So am I. See you tomorrow. Surely. But, Frank. Yes. Callie hesitated, then looked directly into his eyes. Frank, she said, if your father, somehow, doesn't clear up this affair, you and Joe simply must do it. You must. For the Robinsons. It means so much to them. Dad won't fall down on it. Don't worry. And Joe and I are giving all the help we can. His confidence was contagious. Callie brightened up immediately. In that case, she said, gaily, the mystery is as good as solved. The three best detectives in the world are working on it. Goodbye, Frank. With that she ran lightly into the house. 14. Red Jack Lay It was another week before Fenton Hardy returned to Bayport. Contrary to the expectations of the boys, he did not arrive from New York. Instead, he came home early one morning, having reached the city by a train from the west. He had sent no advance notice of his arrival, and the first his sons knew of it was when a servant told them that their father had reached the house in the early hours of the morning, plainly careworn and travel-stained. He had gone immediately to bed, leaving orders that he was on no account to be disturbed. This was at breakfast, and although the boys were wild with impatience to learn the outcome of their father's trip, they were obliged to curb their curiosity. Mr. Hardy was still sleeping when they left for school that morning and, to their surprise, he was asleep when they came back home for lunch. He must be mighty tired, remarked Joe. I wonder where on earth he came from. Probably been up all night. When Dad gets hard at work on a case he forgets all about sleep. I'll bet he found something. Hope so. But I wish he'd wake up and tell us. I hate to go back to school without knowing. But Mr. Hardy had not awakened by the time the boys set out for school again, although they lingered until they were in danger of being late. All afternoon they were tormented by curiosity. Where had their father been? What had he discovered? As soon as school was out they fled down the steps, broke away from a group of boys anxious to get up a baseball game, and shattered all records in their race for home. Fenton Hardy was in the library, and as they rushed panting into the room he grinned broadly at his sons, for he was quite well aware that they were impatient to hear an account of his trip. He looked refreshed after his long sleep and it was evident that his trip had not been entirely without success, for his manner was cheerful. The Hardy boys knew their father well, and they knew that when a case was difficult of solution the great detective became moody and worried. What luck, Dad, asked Frank perching on the arm of an easy chair. Mr. Hardy raised his eyebrows, pretending not to understand. About what, he inquired. About the case. The Tower Mansion case. The red wig. Did you find out who owned it? Did you catch the thief? Whoa. Whoa. Not all at once. A question at a time please. Now, do I understand that you want to know if I found out anything about the Tower Mansion affair? Don't keep us waiting, Dad, pleaded Joe. You know that's what we're asking you about. Well, answered Mr. Hardy, yes and no. That's not much of an answer, objected Frank, in disappointment. 
It's the best answer I can give, unfortunately. I did find out something about the red wig. But as for connecting its wearer with the tower robbery, that is still to come. You traced the fellow who wore the wig? I did. And he turned out to be a well-known criminal, well-known to the police, that is. What's his name? asked Joe. Jack Lay. John Jack Lay, commonly known as Red Dot. Because he has red hair? No. Because he hasn't red hair. That reverses the usual order of nicknames, I imagine. This fellow Jack Lay has a fondness for wearing red wigs. And was he the man who stole Chet's roadster? It seems almost certain. I traced the wig, which had been originally stolen from an actor in New York. I traced it to Jack Lay because his habit of wearing red wigs is well known to the police, and by locating him and keeping a close watch on him and paying a call at his room one night when he was out, I managed to find some of the loot that he had taken when he robbed the actor. That seemed to connect everything up very well. Where did you find him? asked Frank. In New York. He wasn't in hiding, for he hadn't been sought for any particular crime at the time. The police seemed to overlook him in their investigation of the dressing room theft. Did you accuse him? No. I wanted to learn more. When I found the articles that had been stolen from the actor and knew that the wig found by the roadster had been taken at the same time, I knew Red Jack Lay was the auto thief. But I wanted to get some information on the Tower Mansion affair if possible. So I took a room in the house in which Jack Lay was living, and kept a close watch on him. Did you learn anything? Mr. Hardy shook his head. Jack Lay himself spoiled everything. He got mixed up in a jewel robbery and cleared out of the city. Luckily, I heard him packing up, and I trailed him. The police were watching for him and he couldn't get out by railway, that is, not in the ordinary manner. Instead, he tried to make his escape by jumping a freight. And you still followed? I lost him two or three times, but luck was with me, and somehow I managed to pick up his trail again. He got out of the city, out into New Jersey, and then his luck failed him. A railway detective recognized him and then the chase was on. Up to that time I had been content with just keeping behind him, I had hoped to pose as a fellow fugitive and win his confidence. But when the chase started in real earnest I had to join with the other officers. And they caught Jack Lay? Not without a chase. Jack Lay, by the way, was once a railroad man. Strangely enough, he once worked not many miles from here. He managed to steal a railway gasoline speeder and got away from us. But he didn't last long, for the speeder jumped the tracks on a curve and Jack Lay was badly smashed up. Was he killed? I don't think he'll live. He's in a hospital right now and the doctors say he hasn't much of a chance. But he's under arrest. Oh, yes. He is being held for the jewel robbery and also for the robbery from the actor's dressing room. But I don't think he'll live to answer either charge. Didn't you find out anything that would connect him with the tower robbery? Not a thing. The Hardy boys were disappointed, and their expressions showed it. If Red Jack Lay died, the secret of the tower robbery would die with him, for by now Frank and Joe were convinced that the notorious criminal had indeed been the thief for whose misdeeds Mr. Robinson was now suffering. And if the secret died with him, Mr. Robinson would be doomed to spend the rest of his life under a cloud, suspected of being a thief. Have you seen Jack Lay yet? asked Frank. After the smash-up. But I didn't have a chance to talk to him. You might have been able to get a confession from him. Fenton Hardy nodded. I may be able to get one yet. If he is sure he is going to die he may admit everything. I intend to make an effort to see him in the hospital and ask him about the tower robbery anyway. Is he far away? Mr. Hardy named a small city not far distant from Bayport. I explained my mission to the doctor in charge and he promised to telephone me as soon as it was possible for Jack Lay to see anyone. 
I'm convinced that the fellow had something to do with the tower affair. It's a certainty that he stole the automobile, the wig proves that. By the same token it's certain that he was the man who tried to hold up the ticket office. Having failed in that attempt, it seems more than likely that an old-time criminal like Jack Lay would look around for something else to do before he left Bayport. You say he used to work near here, asked Joe. He was once employed by the railroad, and he knows all the country around here well. Then he got mixed up in some thefts from freight cars and after he got out of jail he became a professional criminal. It was when I was looking over the records that I found out about his fondness for wearing a red wig. That was what eventually proved his undoing. If he had not robbed the actor's dressing room to get the wig that he used when he was in Bayport, I would never have traced him. At that moment it was announced that Chief Colleague of the Bayport Police Force wished to see Fenton Hardy. The detective winked at the boys, and told the servant to show the chief in. Chief Colleague entered the room, mopping his brow with a handkerchief, for it was a hot day and he was a stout man. Behind him came Detective Smuff, fanning himself with a straw hat. Good afternoon, gentlemen, said Mr. Hardy genially, won't you sit down? Chief Colleague eased himself into an armchair. Detective Smuff leaned against the table. Both glanced inquiringly at the two boys. Unless your business is very private, I'd just as soon have the boys stay, suggested Mr. Hardy pleasantly. He did not trust Chief Colleague and Detective Smuff, who came to him only in emergencies and who usually took all the credit for themselves whenever he helped them out of their difficulties. He preferred to have the boys present as witnesses. How about it, Chief? asked Smuff heavily. Can they stay? I guess so, grunted Chief Colleague, undoing the collar of his uniform. Can't do no good and they can't do no harm. Well, gentlemen, to what do I owe the honor of this visit? asked Mr. Hardy. We've been hearing things about this Tower Mansion case, observed Chief Colleague gravely. You've been working on it, eh? Perhaps. You've been out of town for quite a few days. You must have been working on it. That's what we deduce, anyway, put in Detective Smuff. Perhaps it's my own business. Police business is everybody's business, declared Colleague judicially. What we want to know is, did you find any clues? Detective Smuff fished out the inevitable notebook and pencil. I'll note him down, Chief, he remarked. You may as well put back the notebook, Smuff, snapped Fenton Hardy, with annoyance. If I went away, it is my own business, and if I am still working on the tower robbery, that's my business too. I'll thank you to keep to your own affairs. Chief Colleague opened his mouth, then closed it again. He took out his handkerchief and mopped his brow, all the while staring at Fenton Hardy. Then he turned and gazed at Smuff. Detective Smuff, he said, in a solemn voice, did you hear that? I did. What do you think of it, Detective Smuff? I think, I think, Detective Smuff groped for an expression that would encompass the magnitude of the offence, I think Mr. Hardy is guilty of obstructing the cause of justice, he said grandly. Obstructing fiddlesticks, said Mr. Hardy. I'm minding my own business which is more than some police officers seem capable of doing. Chief Colleague sighed. The trouble with you, Mr. Hardy, he said, is that you won't cooperate. If you cooperated a little more, we would all be farther ahead. There ain't any cooperation at all. Here is me and Smuff, doing our best to drive crime out of Bayport, and you won't cooperate. Perhaps the fact that there is a thousand dollars reward in the case isn't making you anxious for some cooperation, suggested Fenton Hardy dryly. It ain't got nothing to do with it, replied Chief Colleague virtuously. We're just anxious to see this affair cleared up, that's all. Now, Mr. Hardy, we hear you were with the officers that chased this here notorious criminal Red Jack Lay. Mr. Hardy gave a perceptible start. 
He had no idea that news of the capture of Jack Lay had reached Bayport, much less that news of his own participation in the chase had reached the city. What of it? Did Jack Lay have anything to do with this here tower case? How should I know? Wasn't that what you were working on? That's my affair. Detective Smuff and Chief Collig looked at one another. You ain't cooperating, complained Chief Collig. You're going to put us to a whole lot of worry and expense just because you won't give us a little cooperation. Just what do you mean? Detective Smuff and me was thinking of going over to the hospital where this man Jack Lay is and giving him the third degree about the tower case. Fenton Hardy's lips narrowed into a straight line. You can't do that. The doctor won't let you see him. We're going to try, anyway. There's a train at seven o'clock, and we aim to have a talk with this fellow Jack Lay tonight. Mr. Hardy shrugged his shoulders. Go ahead. It means nothing to me. But if you take my advice you'll stay away. You'll just spoil everything. Jack Lay will talk when the time comes. Oh, ho, said Detective Smuff triumphantly. Then there is something to it, hey. I knew there was, said Chief Colleague. Come on, Smuff. We'll make this man Jack Lay talk yet. We're officers of the law, we are and I'd like to see any doctor keep us from doing our duty. He mopped his brow again, put on his hat, nodded to Fenton Hardy, and clumped out of the room. Detective Smuff, putting his notebook into his pocket, followed. The door closed behind them. Mr. Hardy sat back with a gesture of despair. They'll spoil everything, he said. They're just so clumsy that Red Jack Lay will close up like a clam if they try to make him talk. Perhaps, remarked Frank significantly, they'll miss their train. At that moment the telephone rang. Mr. Hardy answered it. Hello, yes, this is Fenton Hardy, yes, oh, yes, doctor, he is well, well, is that so, won't live until morning, I can see him, fine, thank you, goodbye. He put back the receiver. There, he said wearily, just my luck. Red Jack Lay is dying, and the doctor says I can see him tonight. But Colleague and Smuff will have first right to talk to him, for they are officials and I'm only a private detective. If Jack Lay confesses, they'll have the credit for it. They'll just have to miss their train, said Frank. Come on, Joe. Let's see what we can do. 15. The chief gets a bomb. What's up now? asked Joe, when the Hardy boys had left the house. Chief colleague and Detective Smuff must miss that train. But how? I don't know just yet, but they've got to miss it. If they reach the hospital tonight they'll interview Jack Lay first. One of two things will happen. They'll either get a confession and take all the credit for clearing up the case, or they'll go about it so clumsily that Jack Lay will say nothing and spoil everything for Dad. The Hardy boys walked along the street in silence. They realized that the situation was urgent, but although they racked their brains trying to think of some way in which to prevent Chief Colleague and Detective Smuff from catching the train, it seemed hopeless. Let's round up the gang, suggested Joe. Perhaps they can think of something. The gang consisted of the boys who had been with Frank and Joe the day they held the picnic in the woods. There was, of course, Chet Morton. Besides him were Alan Hooper, otherwise known as Biff, because of his passion for boxing, Jerry Gilroy, Phil Cohen and Tony Preto, all students at the Bayport High School. They were usually to be found on the school campus after hours, playing ball, and there the Hardy boys soon located them. The game was just breaking up. Pikers, grinned Chet Morton when he saw the Hardy boys approaching. You wouldn't play ball when we asked you to, and now you come around when the game's all over. We had something more important on our minds, replied Frank. We need your help. What's the matter? asked Tony Preto. Tony was the son of a prosperous Italian building contractor, 
but he had not yet been in America long enough to talk the language without an accent, and his attempts were frequently the cause of much amusement to his companions. He was quick and good-natured, however, and laughed as much at his own errors as anyone else did. Chief colleague and Detective Smuff are butting into one of Dad's cases, said Frank. We can't tell you much more about it than that. But the whole thing is that they mustn't catch the seven o'clock train. What do you want us to do? asked Biff Hooper. Blow up the bridge? We might lock Colleg and Smuff in one of their own cells, suggested Phil Cohen. And get locked in ourselves, added Jerry Gilroy. Be sensible. Are you serious about this, Frank? Absolutely. If those two catch that train dad's case will be ruined. And I don't mind telling you it has something to do with Perry Robinson. Chet Morton whistled. Ah, ha. I see now. The Tower Affair. In that case, we'll see to it that the seven o'clock train leaves here without our worthy chief and his equally worthy, although dumb, detective. He hated Smuff, for the sleuth had once or twice tried to arrest the boys for bathing in a forbidden section of the bay. There is only one question left, said Phil solemnly. And what is that? How to keep them from getting on the train. Get your brains to work, fellows, if you have any, ordered Jerry Gilroy. Let's figure out a plan. A dozen plans were suggested, each wilder than the one before. Biff Hooper was in favor of kidnapping the chief and his detective, binding them hand and foot and setting them adrift in the bay in an open boat. Phil Cohen suggested putting the chief's watch an hour ahead. That plan, as Frank observed, would have been a good one but for the little difficulty of laying hands on the watch. Chet Morton thought it would be a good idea to start a fight in front of the police station just as Colleg and Smuff were about to leave for the train. The possibility that they might all land in jail as a result made this suggestion unpopular. If we were in Italy we could get the Black Hand to help, said Tony Preto. The Black Hand, declared Chet. That's a good idea. We got no black hand society in Bayport, objected Tony. Let's get one up. Send the chief a black hand letter warning him not to take that train. And if he ever found who wrote it, we'd all be up to our necks in trouble, pointed out Joe. I'd like to put a bomb under his old police station. Fine idea, applauded Tony. Where we get the bomb? Leave it to me, announced Chet Morton mysteriously. I'll get a bomb. I'll guarantee to keep the chief in town. Not a real bomb, asked Frank. Why not, said Chet. Listen to me. Chet proceeded to lay forth his plan in a stealthy whisper. It was received with chuckles and murmurs of admiration. His companions clapped him on the back and when he had finished the boys hastened down the street toward the hardy home. In the rear of the house were a garage and an old barn. In the barn was a gymnasium that the hardy boys had fitted out for themselves, and here was the usual collection of old toys, footballs, broken baseball bats and such paraphernalia, to be found wherever boys store their cherished possessions. Frank groped about among the rubbish in one corner until at last he rose with an exclamation of triumph holding aloft a shining object. It's here, he said. Let's get busy. There's no time to lose. An old box was quickly produced, and in it the shining object was placed. The box was then carefully wrapped up, and in a few minutes the boys left the barn, Tony carrying the package under one arm. Not far from the Bayport police station was a fruit stand over which presided an Italian by the name of Rocco. He was a simple, genial soul, who believed almost everything he heard and, like most of his countrymen, he was of an excitable nature. Toward Rocco's fruit stand the boys made their way. Rocco was sorting over his oranges when they approached. Tony, with the box under his arm, hung in the background, while Chet stepped boldly forward. How much are your oranges, Rocco? he asked. Rocco, with much explanatory waving of arms, 
recited the prices of the various grades of oranges. Too much. There's a fellow at another fruit stand on the next street sells them a nickel a dozen cheaper. He no can do, shrieked Rocco. My price is D.A. low. Then, angered by this reflection on the prices of his wares, he burst into a lengthy explanation of the struggles confronting a poor Italian trying to get along in a new country. He grabbed Chet by the coat collar, dragged him to a corner of the fruit stall, bade him inspect the fruit, gabbled off prices, and generally worked himself into a state of high indignation. In the meantime, Tony Preto made good use of his time to shove the mysterious package under the front of the stall. Then he joined the other boys who had screened his movements by gathering about Rocco. You'll have the black hand after you if you keep on charging such high prices, that's all I can say, declared Chet, as the boys moved away. Poof. W at do I care for D.A. blacker hand. No frighten me, said Rocco bravely, but he gulped when he said it and there was no doubt that the shot had gone home. It was now after six o'clock, and the boys decided that in the interests of their plan they would have to brook the parental wrath by being late for supper. Frank had assumed that Chief Colleague and Detective Smuff would be leaving to catch the train at about ten minutes to seven, so shortly after 6.30, Phil Cohen, who had remained in the background during the interview with Rocco, walked smartly up to the fruit stand again. The others were viewing the scene from around the corner of a nearby building. Banana, said Phil briefly, tossing a nickel on the counter. When he had received the fruit he began to eat it, at the same time chatting with Rocco. W at UT Inc., snickered the Italian, some boys come here a while ago and say D.A. Blacker hand T. Inc. I charge too much for D.A. fruit. Well, you do charge too much, Rocco. Everybody says so. I sell a DA good fruit at DA good price. Phil turned aside and at the same time accidentally knocked an apple to the ground. He bent to pick it up, Rocco eyeing him narrowly in case he tried to slip it into his pocket. But Phil did not get up at once. Instead, he said. Oi. What's this? W at you find. What's this, Rocco? Phil rose from in front of the stand, with the package in his hands. I found this under the counter. Rocco stared. His mouth opened in dismay. For, sounding clearly from the inside of the package, came a steady tick-tock, tick-tock. A bomb, he shrieked. Put him down. Thereupon he scrambled wildly over the array of fruit at the back of the stand, knocked over a tray of oranges, and went sprawling over the opposite counter, roaring, police, at the top of his lungs. Phil, with a fine imitation of fright, put the package on top of the counter and fled. Rocco, in his white apron, was dancing about in the middle of the street, yelling, bombs. Police. D.A. Blacker hand. Then, suddenly fearing that the supposed bomb might explode at any moment, he whirled rapidly about and raced down the street away from the stand, in the general direction of the police station. He reached the doorway just as Chief Colleague and Detective Smuff were leaving for the train. Panting with fear and excitement, Rocco implored them to save him from the black handers who had put a bomb under his fruit stand. D.A. bomb, she go teep tark, he wailed. She blow a D.A. stand into D.A. little piece. A bomb, exclaimed Chief Colleague. Surely not in Bayport. I always thought there was black handers around here, said Smuff. She blow up DA fruit stand. Come Qek. Chief Colleague and Detective Smuff followed Rocco to the corner. Then they peeped around until they could see the deserted fruit stand, with the package on the counter. You say it goes TikTok? Just lick a DA clock. Must be a bomb, all right, said Smuff. They run by clockwork. Might go off any minute, observed the chief. I hate to go near it. Smuff, you go and pour a pail of water over it. Me? 
Yes, you. You're not afraid, are you? No, I'm not afraid, muttered Smuff, mopping his brow. But I got to think of my wife and family. Coward, said the chief. I do it myself, only it wouldn't be right, seeing I'm your superior officer. Bad for discipline. The worthy officers stared at the package on the fruit stand counter, while Rocco danced with impatience. Neither colleague nor Smuff dared approach closer, but they realized something must be done. Where's Riley? asked the chief at last. Out on his beat, around the corner. Get him. Smuff departed hastily, glad of the chance to get away from the vicinity of the bomb. He was some time in locating Con Riley, and when at last that minion of the law was escorted back to the chief, seven o'clock had come and gone. So had the train. 16. A Confession Riley ordered the chief, see that package on the counter of the fruit stand. Go and get it and pour a pail of water over it. Huh? exclaimed Riley, gaping. Pour a pail of water over it. Riley took off his helmet and scratched his head. He began to wonder if his chief's brain had been affected by the heat. Don't stand there staring at me, snapped Colleg. Hurry up and obey orders. This is the meanest job I ever got, observed Con Riley. But he ambled across the street, wondering why a crowd of people had collected, for word had quickly spread that a bomb had been found under Rocco's fruit stand, and when he reached the package he inspected it wonderingly. Meb she blower him all to DA bits, suggested Rocco fearfully. He has insurance, consoled the chief. We'll give him a good funeral, observed Smuff. Con Riley hunted around the fruit stand until he found a pail, and then he went up the street until he located a tap. Finally, with the pail full of water, he went back to the fruit stand, dumped the water over the package, and stood awaiting further orders. Soak it again, roared the chief, who was taking no chances. Con Riley sighed, but did as he was told. For five minutes he was kept busy dumping innumerable pails of water over the package, and only then did Chief Colleague and Detective Smuff venture forth. Then, with fear and trembling, Chief Colleague handed the package to Smuff and bade him open it. Smuff's hands were shaking so that he could scarcely tear apart the coverings from the water-soaked parcel. The chief withdrew to a safe distance. Con Riley, who had just been told by a friend that he had been pouring water over a live bomb, was trying to achieve a sickly smile as the crowd congratulated him on his bravery. Detective Smuff opened the package. The coverings fell away. The cardboard box, dripping with water, tumbled apart. A bright object fell to the pavement with a clatter. Everybody jumped. But there was no cause for fear. The bright object was nothing more harmful than an old alarm clock. The hardy boys and their chums, mingling with the crowd, roared with laughter, and when the crowd saw how Chief Colleague and his assistants had been duped they joined in the merriment. An alarm clock, roared someone. They thought an alarm clock was a bomb. Pouring water over an alarm clock. Chief Colleague and Smuff returned to the police station with all the dignity they could muster under the circumstances. The crowd howled and whooped with laughter. The Hardy Boys went home smiling. The seven o'clock train had left half an hour before. Their father was making the trip to the city without the interference of the chief and his assistant, Smuff. Fenton Hardy returned home late that night and at the breakfast table next morning he was in high spirits. Solved another mystery, asked Mrs. Hardy gaily, as she poured the coffee. She seldom asked questions about her husband's work, being of a gentle nature that instinctively shrank from any discussion of crime. It frequently distressed her that Mr. Hardy's occupation should be one that meant terms of imprisonment for those whom his cunning and cleverness had brought to justice. But her husband's attitude this morning was so unmistakably jubilant that she was glad for his sake if he had scored another success.
Practically solved, my dear. If you'd care to hear all about it. Not me. You know I don't care to hear about these terrible things. Well, the boys shall hear of it then. They are interested. If they'll come into my den after breakfast I'll tell them all about it. That means you succeeded, Frank said. Eat your bacon and eggs and don't be impatient. After breakfast the boys went with their father into the den off the library, eagerly awaiting news of his mission of the previous evening. They had not told him how Chief Colleague and Detective Smuff had missed the train, but they were shrewdly certain that their efforts in this respect had been of considerable assistance to Mr. Hardy. First of all, said the detective, Jack Lay is dead. Did he confess? You're not very sympathetic for the poor fellow. Yes, he confessed. Fortunately, Chief Colleague and Detective Smuff didn't show up. Fenton Hardy saw that Joe and Frank glanced at one another, and he smiled quietly. I have an idea that you two scamps know more about that than you would care to tell. However, they failed to show up, and I had a clear field ahead of me. I saw Jack Lay just before he died. And I questioned him about the tower robbery. He admitted it. He admitted everything. He said he came to Bayport with the intention of robbing the ticket office. When he failed in that attempt he decided to hang around for a few days, and then he hit upon Tower Mansion as his next effort. He entered the place and opened the safe. Then he took the jewels and the bonds. What did he do with the loot? That's what I'm coming to. I had quite a time making Jack Lay confess to the tower affair and it was not until he was on the point of death that he admitted it. Then he said, yes, I took the stuff, but I couldn't get away with it. You can get it back easily. I hid it in the old tower. That was all he said. He became unconscious then and died in a few minutes. Just why he couldn't get away with the loot and why he hid it in the tower, I don't know. He didn't have time to tell me. But he said it was hidden in the old tower. Why, we'll find it in no time, exclaimed Frank. Tower Mansion has two towers, the old and the new. We'll search the old tower. The story seems likely enough, said Mr. Hardy. Jack Lay would gain nothing by lying about it when he was on his deathbed. He probably became frightened after he committed the robbery and hid in the old tower until he saw the coast was clear and he was able to get away. Then no doubt he decided to hide the stuff there and take a chance on coming back for it some time after the affair had blown over. That was why he couldn't be traced through the jewels and the bonds, Joe said. They were never disposed of at all. They've been lying in the old tower all this time. I tried to get him to tell me in just what part of the tower the loot was hidden, continued Fenton Hardy, but he died before he could say any more. I hid it in the old tower. He just managed to gasp that out before he became unconscious. It shouldn't be hard to find the stuff, now that we have a general idea of where it is, Frank pointed out. Probably he didn't hide it very carefully. The old tower has been unoccupied for a long time and it is rarely entered. The stuff would be as safe there as if he had hidden it miles away. Joe got up from his chair. I think we ought to get busy and go search the old tower right away. Oh, boy. If we can only hand old Applegate his jewels and bonds this morning and clear Mr. Robinson. Let's start. I'll leave it to you boys to make the search, said Mr. Hardy with a smile. I've no doubt the stuff will be easily recovered, and you can have the satisfaction of turning it over to Mr. Applegate. I guess you can get along without me in this case from now on. We wouldn't have got very far if it hadn't been for you. And I wouldn't have got very far if it hadn't been for you, so we're even, smiled Mr. Hardy. Be on your way, then, and good luck to you. We'll find it, never fear, promised Frank, putting on his cap. I hope the Applegates don't throw us out when we ask to be allowed to look around in the old tower. 
Just tell them you have a pretty good clue to where the bonds and jewels are hidden and they'll let you search to your heart's content, Mr. Hardy advised. Come on then, Joe. We'll have that thousand dollar reward before the morning is over. Their father glanced at them shrewdly. Don't count your chickens before they are hatched, he said. And then, as the boys hastened out of the den, he called after them, also, you might remember the old proverb that there is many a slip between the cup and the lip. But the hardy boys scarcely heard him, so eager were they to begin searching the old tower and so confident were they that the mystery was about to be cleared up. 17. The Search of the Tower When the hardy boys reached Tower Mansion that morning the door was answered by Herd Applegate himself. The tall, stooped gentleman peered at them through his thick-lensed glasses. In one hand he held a sheet of stamps, for it was his custom to devote the mornings to his collection. Yes, he said testily, for he was annoyed at being disturbed. What do you boys want here at this hour of day? You remember us, don't you? asked Frank politely. We're Mr. Hardy's sons. Fenton Hardy, the detective. Are you his boys? Yes, sir. Well, what do you want? We'd like to take a look through the old tower, if you don't mind. We've got a new clue about the robbery you had here a while ago. Want to look through the old tower? Of all the impudence. What do you want to look through the tower for? And what has that got to do with the robbery? We have evidence that leads us to believe the jewels and bonds were hidden in the tower by the thief. Oh. You have evidence, have you? The old man peered at them very closely. It's that rascal Robinson, I'll warrant. He hid the stuff there, and now he's put you up to going and finding it, just to clear himself. The Hardy boys had not considered the affair in this light, and they gazed at Mr. Applegate in consternation. At last Joe found his tongue. Mr. Robinson isn't mixed up in this at all, he said the real thief was found. He said the stuff was hidden in the old tower. If you will just let us take a look around, we'll find it for you. Who was the real thief, then? We can't tell you just now, sir. Wait till we find the stolen goods and we'll tell you the whole story. Mr. Applegate took off his glasses and wiped them with his handkerchief. He glared at the boys suspiciously for a few moments. Then he called out. Adelia. A high cracked voice from the dim regions of the hallway answered. What do you want? Come here a minute. There was a rustle of skirts, and then Adelia Applegate, maiden sister of the owner of Tower Mansion, appeared. She was a faded blonde woman, of thin features, and she was dressed in a gown of a fashion fifteen years back in which every color of the spectrum fought for supremacy. What's the matter now? she demanded. Can't a body sit down to do a bit of sewing without you hollering at them? These boys want to look through the old tower. What for? Up to some mischief, I'll be bound. They think they can find the bonds and jewels. Oh, they do, do they? sniffed the woman. And what would the bonds and jewels be doing in the old tower? We have evidence that they were hidden there after the robbery, replied Frank. Miss Applegate sniffed again and viewed the boys with frank suspicion. As if any thief would be fool enough to hide them right in the house he robbed. These are Mr. Hardy's boys, explained Herd Applegate. He is the big detective, you know. All detectives, said Miss Applegate, are nosy. Always prying into other people's affairs. We're just trying to help you, put in Joe politely. Go ahead, then. Go ahead, said Miss Applegate, with a sigh. Come around at this hour of morning, disturbing honest folks. Go ahead, and tear the old tower to pieces if you like. But I'll be bound you won't find anything. It's all foolishness. You won't find anything. Consent having been given, 
Herd Applegate led the way through the gloomy halls and corridors of the mansion toward the old tower. He was inclined to share his sister's view that the boy's search would be in vain. Might as well save yourselves the trouble, he declared. You won't find anything in the old tower. If anything was hidden there it's been taken away by this time. We'll make a try at it, anyway, Mr. Applegate. Don't ask me to help you. I've got better things to do. Just got some new stamps in this morning and you interrupted me when I was sorting them out. I've got to get back to my work. The man led the way into a corridor that was heavy with dust. It had not been in use for a long time and it was bare and unfurnished. Leading off this corridor was a heavy door. It was unlocked, and when Mr. Applegate opened it the boys saw that a flight of stairs lay beyond. There you are. Those stairs lead up into the tower. Search away. You won't find anything. I hope we do, Mr. Applegate, said Frank. And I'm pretty sure we shall. Yes, boys are always going to do wonders. Go ahead. Live and learn. Waste your time. And with this parting shot, Heard Applegate turned and hobbled back along the corridor, the sheet of stamps still in his gnarled hand. He was muttering to himself as he departed. The hardy boys looked at one another. Not very encouraging, is he, Frank? Not a bit of it. But it will be so much the better for us if we get the stuff back for him. He won't think we were wasting our time then. Let's get up into the tower. I'm anxious to start. The tower was about five stories in height, as compared with the rest of the mansion, which had but three stories. The lower floor was empty. The floors and walls were heavy with dust. Frank and Joe first examined the stairs carefully for footprints, but there were none to be seen. That seems queer, remarked Frank. If Jack Lay had been in here within the past month you'd think his footprints would still show. By the appearance of this dust, there hasn't been anyone in the tower for at least a year. Perhaps the dust collects more quickly than we think. It may have covered his footprints over even within a couple of weeks. An inspection of the ground floor revealed the fact that there was no place where the loot could have been hidden, save under the stairs, and there was nothing in that place of concealment. Accordingly, the hardy boys ascended to the next floor, finding themselves in a room as drab and bare as the one they had just left. Here again the dust lay heavy and the murky windows were thick with cobwebs. There was an atmosphere of age and decay about the entire place. It seemed to have been abandoned for years. Nothing here, said Frank, after a quick glance around. On we go. They made their way up to the next floor after again poking about under the stairs, but again without success. The next room was a duplicate of the first. It was bare and cheerless, deep in dust. There was not the slightest sign of a hiding place. Much less was there any indication that another human being had been in the tower for years. Doesn't look very promising, Joe. Still, he may have gone right to the top of the tower. So the search continued, until at last the hardy boys had reached the top of the tower. Here they emerged into the open air, coming through a trapdoor that led through the roof from the upper room. They were now standing on a platform, and far below them lay the city of Bayport. To the east was Barmet Bay, the waters sparkling in the sun. The platform was quite bare. The stone walls gave no opportunity of a hiding place. Their search had been in vain. We were fooled, I guess, Frank admitted. There hasn't been anyone in this tower for years. I knew it as soon as I saw there were no footprints. The boys gazed moodily down over the city, and then down over the grounds of Tower Mansion. The roofs of the mansion itself were far below, and directly across from them rose the heavy bulk of the new tower. Do you think he might have meant the new tower, exclaimed Joe suddenly. Dad said he specified the old one. But he may have been mistaken. In the darkness and everything, 
perhaps he didn't know the difference. That's possible, too. It's certain that he didn't hide anything in this tower, at any rate. Although why he should say the old tower. Let's ask Mr. Applegate if we can search the new tower, too. What a fine chance we have. He'll cry over us now in real earnest when we go back and tell him we didn't find anything. He'll say I told you so, and if we try to get into the new tower he'll just laugh at us. It's worth trying, anyway. We can tell him the whole story about Jack Lay. That ought to convince him. Disappointed, the Hardy boys descended through the trapdoor, and then made their way down through the tower until at last they were in the long gloomy hallway again. Their clothes were covered with dust and their hands and faces were grimy. Slowly, they trudged back into the main part of the mansion again, and there they met Adelia Applegate, who popped out of a doorway as they were passing and cackled with delight. So these are the fine boys who are going to find the stolen stuff for us, eh? she exclaimed, in her cracked voice. So these are the boys who were so sure it was hidden in the old tower. Well, well. And they didn't find anything after all. I'm afraid we didn't, Miss Applegate, Frank answered, with a smile. But if you and Mr. Applegate will let us tell our story I think we can convince you that we really thought the stuff was hidden there. Even yet I believe it is hidden somewhere in the mansion, probably in the new tower. In the new tower, she sniffed. Absurd. I suppose you'll want to go poking through there now. If it wouldn't be too much trouble. It would be too much trouble, indeed, she shrilled. I shan't have any boys rummaging all through my house on a wild goose chase like this. You'd better leave right away, and forget all this nonsense. Her voice had attracted the attention of Herd Applegate, who came hobbling out of his study at that moment. Now what's the matter, he demanded. Then, seeing the boys, his face became creased in a triumphant smile. Ah, ha! So you didn't find anything after all? He! He! He began to chuckle, immensely pleased with himself. I told you so. 18. The New Tower They have the audacity to want to go looking through the new tower now, said Miss Applegate, in high indignation. Heard Applegate's smile vanished. You can't do anything of the sort, he snapped. Are you boys trying to make a fool out of me? I knew mighty well you wouldn't find anything in the old tower. And we were pretty sure we would, answered Frank. Listen, Mr. Applegate, we'll be fair with you. We'll tell you exactly why we wanted to make this search. Go ahead and tell me. Why didn't you tell me before? Because we wanted to work this out ourselves, as far as possible. But the information we had came from the man who stole the jewels and the bonds. What? Has he been caught? He was captured, but he will never come to trial. Did he escape again? He escaped by death. The thief is dead. Dead. What happened? asked Herd Applegate excitedly. His name was Red Jack Lay, and he was a notorious criminal. He was tracked down by our father, and when he tried to escape on a railroad handcar he got into a smash-up, and he was fatally injured. But before he died, he admitted robbing Tower Mansion. He admitted it. He confessed. He confessed everything. I don't believe it, sniffed Adelia Applegate. Nothing will ever convince me that it wasn't that rascal Robinson. Jack Lay confessed the whole business, Frank persisted. And on his deathbed he said that he hadn't been able to get away with the loot. That he had hidden it. Where? In the old tower. And it isn't there. Joe and I have just searched the place high and low. The stuff isn't there. And from the fact that there are no footprints or marks of any kind in the dust, I don't think anyone has been in the place for a long time. The old tower has been closed for years. So we thought, 
Joe interjected, that he might have been mistaken and that he had really hidden the stuff in the new tower instead. Herd Applegate rubbed his chin meditatively. His manner toward the boys had undergone a change, and it was evident that he was impressed by their story. So this fellow confessed to the robbery, eh? He admitted everything. He was a man who once worked around Bayport and he knew this locality pretty well. He had been hanging around the city for some days before the robbery. Well, said Applegate slowly, if he says he hid the stuff in the old tower and it isn't there, he must have meant the new tower, just as you say. Will you let us search it? I'll do more than that. I'll help you. I'm just as anxious to get the jewels and bonds back as anybody. All nonsense, declared Adelia Applegate. It's all a pack of fossids. I don't believe a word of it. Now, now, Adelia, said her brother soothingly, these boys may be right after all. It won't hurt to take a look around, at any rate. And much you'll find, I'm sure. I declare, Herd Applegate, you're just as bad as those boys are. Maybe, maybe, he answered. But I'm going to help them search the new tower, anyway. Don't ask me to brush the dust off your clothes when you come back, then. For that's all you'll get. Dust. Nothing more. The jewels and bonds are no more in the new tower than they are back in the safe right now. All right, Adelia. Perhaps you're right. But it won't hurt to make a search, anyway. Come on, boys. With that, Herd Applegate led the way down the hall and opened the door leading to a corridor that extended toward the new tower. Frank and Joe, tingling with excitement, followed. Although the new tower had been built just a few years back and although its rooms had been furnished, it had been seldom occupied, save on the rare occasions when the Applegates had visitors from the city. The new caretaker, employed to replace Robinson, was a lazy and slovenly fellow, who did not bother to extend his duties to the tower, knowing that the Applegates seldom went near that part of the mansion and realizing that any laxity in his duties in that respect would scarcely be discovered. It came as a surprise to Herd Applegate, then, to find out that the new tower was dusty, that the windows had not been cleaned, that there were cobwebs on the ceilings. In the first room they found nothing, although they rummaged about in all the corners, looked beneath the table, behind the chairs, looked everywhere, in fact. Not until they were quite satisfied that the loot had not been hidden there, did they ascend the stairs to the next room, and there again their search was fruitless. Heard Applegate, being a quick-tempered man, fell back into his old mood. The boy's story had convinced him, and he had been even more certain than they that the stolen bonds and jewels would indeed be found in the new tower. But when two of the tower rooms had been thoroughly searched without success, his disappointment increased. Don't believe there was anything in that yarn, after all, he muttered, as they went up the stairs to the third room. I don't see why he should lie about it, after he confessed, remarked Frank thoughtfully. Dad told us that he admitted not being able to get away with the stuff. Then where did he hide it, demanded Applegate. If he wasn't lying, the stuff must be around here someplace. Perhaps he hid it a little more carefully than we imagine, put in Joe. Haven't we hunted carefully enough? Heard Applegate snapped. In the third room their search was again in vain. They even inspected the window ledges and tapped the floors and ceiling in the faint hope of finding some secret cupboard that was unknown to them. But the loot was not found. When at last they emerged through the trapdoor in the roof, out on top of the rear tower, and found it to be bare and empty, Applegate could not disguise his chagrin. Wild goose chase, he snorted. Adelia was right. I've been made a fool of. You don't think we would make up a story like that, do you, Mr. Applegate? Frank asked. I don't see any reason why you should. But there's something wrong somewhere. 
I've wasted half a morning poking around through this confounded tower, all for nothing. So have we. If that fellow did hide the stuff in one of the towers, someone else must have come along and got it. That's the only way I can figure it out. He had someone working with him. Or else Robinson found the stuff, that's more likely. Probably Robinson found the loot right after the robbery and kept it for himself. I don't think he would do that. He isn't that kind of man, Joe objected. With all that money in front of him, I wouldn't put it past him for a minute. Where did he get that $900, then? Explain that. He can't. He won't tell. As they descended the stairs and went back into the main part of the mansion, Heard Applegate elaborated on this theory. The fact that the loot had not been found in the face of Red Jack Lee's story seemed to strengthen his conviction that Robinson had something to do with the affair. Either Robinson found the stuff and kept it, or else he was in league with Jack Lay, said Applegate. He's mixed up in it some way. I'm sure of that. The boys could say nothing. They realized that the theory was probable, although in their hearts they found it hard to believe that their chum's father could have had anything to do with the theft. They were deeply puzzled and tremendously disappointed, for they had been practically certain that the loot would be found. Now they saw that the only consequence of the whole affair was to involve Mr. Robinson more deeply than ever in the mystery. Back in the hallway they endured the taunts of Adelia Applegate, who cackled jubilantly when she saw that the searching party had returned empty-handed. There now, she crowed. Who's right now? Didn't I tell you it was all nonsense? Heard Applegate, you've simply been made a fool of by these two boys. Now, Adelia, I think they meant well. Meant well? Of course they meant well. And what did it gain you? They have prowled through the place all morning and all the good that's come of it is that perhaps you won't be so ready to believe the next cock and bull story someone tells you. Go back to your stamps, heard Applegate, and let it be a lesson to you. As for you boys, you should be ashamed of yourselves, disturbing folks like this. Whereupon she escorted the hardy boys to the door, while heard Applegate, muttering sadly, went back to his study with a puzzled air. 19. The mystery deepens. Fenton Hardy was dumbfounded when his sons returned to him with the news that the loot had been found in neither the old tower nor the new. So implicitly had he believed in the dying confession of Red Jack Lay that he had not even bothered to join in the search, preferring to let his sons have the satisfaction of recovering the stolen goods that he was positive were hidden in the old tower. And you're sure you searched the place thoroughly, he asked, for the third time. Every inch of it. There was nothing in the old tower. No one had been there in weeks, answered Frank. How could you tell? By the dust. It hadn't been disturbed. There wasn't a footprint of any kind. But you searched anyway. We went through the tower from top to bottom, Frank replied. It wasn't any use. No one had been there. So then we thought Jack Lay might have been mistaken and that he had left the stuff in the other tower. And Applegate let you search that as well, and Fenton Hardy's eyes twinkled. Not until we had told him our reasons. We told him about Jack Lay, and then he became enthusiastic and even helped us in the search. But we didn't find anything. Strange, muttered the detective. I know Jack Lay wasn't lying. He had nothing to gain by deceiving me. Absolutely nothing. He was in real earnest if ever a man was. I hid it in the old tower. Those were his words. He would have told more if he had been able. And what could he mean but the old tower of Tower Mansion? Why should he be so careful to say the old tower? Everyone knows the mansion has two towers, the old and the new. Of course, it may be that we didn't search thoroughly enough, Joe said. The stuff may be hidden in the flooring or behind the walls. That's the only solution I can think of, replied Fenton Hardy. 
I'm not satisfied yet that the loot isn't there. I'm going to get in touch with Applegate and ask permission for a real, thorough search of both towers. It's to his interest as well as mine. Applegate thinks possibly Jack Lay hid the stuff all right but that Robinson found it and sold it, said Frank. He hinted that he was of the opinion that Robinson was in league with the thief. It does look rather bad, Mr. Hardy admitted. One couldn't blame Applegate very much for thinking Robinson found the stuff after it was hidden and made away with it. Robinson wouldn't do that, cried Joe. He's too honest. I don't think he would do it, either. But sometimes, if a man is in need of money and temptation is placed in his way, he gives in. I'd hate to believe that of Robinson, but if that stuff isn't found in the tower I'll have to admit that it looks very much as if he were mixed up in it. The interview with their father left the Hardy boys feeling far from cheerful, for they saw that Mr. Robinson was now more deeply involved in the affair than before. On the face of it, circumstances seemed to be against the caretaker. Just the same, said Frank, as the boys left the house and went down the street, I don't believe Jack Lay ever hid the stuff in the tower. If he had ever so much as opened the tower door he would have left some marks in the dust and we would have seen them. So I don't believe Robinson came along later and got the loot. As we saw it, the dust in the tower hadn't been disturbed in weeks. Why, there was even dust on the doorknob, when Mr. Applegate let us in. Then, why should Jack Lay say he hid the stuff there, exclaimed Frank, puzzled. Don't ask me. I'm just as much in the dark as you are. When the boys reached the business section of the city they found that already Jack Lee's confession had become common property. People were discussing the deathbed confession on the street corners and newsboys were busy selling copies of papers in which the story of the criminal's last statement was featured on the front page under black headlines. Policeman Con Riley was ambling along Main Street in the morning sunshine, swinging his club with the air of a man without a care in the world. When he saw the boys he frowned, for there was no love lost between the Hardys and the Bayport Police Department. Well, he grunted, I hear you got the stuff back. I wish we had, said Frank. What, said the constable, brightening up at once. You didn't get it? I thought it said in the paper this morning that this fellow Jack Lay told where he had hidden it. He did. And you can't find it. Ho. Ho. Con Riley indulged in a hearty laugh. What a fine detective your father is. Didn't Jack Lay say the stuff was hidden in the old tower? What more does he want? Our father didn't search for the stuff, retorted Frank. We did. And it wasn't there. Jack Lay must have made a mistake. It wasn't there, exclaimed Riley, in high delight. That's a good one. That's the best I've heard in years. He chuckled exceedingly, and slapped his knee. Jack Lay put a good one over on your father that time. Ho! 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 The stuff wasn't there. Riley wiped the tears from his eyes and went on his way, trying to laugh and at the same time retain his dignity as an officer of the law. The joke, he decided, was too good to keep, so as he proceeded back toward the police station, there to edify Chief Colleague and Detective Smuff with the tale, he buttonholed various passers-by and poured the story into their willing ears. It was not long before the yarn had spread throughout the city with that swiftness peculiar to stories spread by word of mouth, and in the telling the story was exaggerated, the net effect being that Fenton Hardy was made to look ridiculous by believing a false confession. Highly coloured accounts of the boys' search of the old tower quickly spread, and throughout the day they were subjected to many caustic and sarcastic inquiries on the part of friends and acquaintances alike. They took all these remarks in good part, although they did not enjoy their sudden prominence. Never mind, said Frank, we'll show them yet. I hope they find that stuff when they search the towers again, added Joe. Then the people will have to eat crow. It'll be our turn to laugh. Yes, agreed Frank, but just now our laughter seems to be in a far distant future. 
When they returned home they found that Fenton Hardy had been busy in the meantime and had convinced Herd Applegate that a thorough search of the towers would be advisable. True, he had not accomplished this without a great deal of opposition on the part of Adelia and without misgivings on the part of Herd Applegate himself, who had by that time come to the conclusion that Robinson had indeed been mixed up in the affair all along. In this conviction he was sustained by Chief Colleague, who had paid a call at the Applegate home as soon as Colleague had told him of the vain search of the towers. The chief says Robinson is behind it, and I'm beginning to think he's right, said Applegate. But how about the confession? Mr. Hardy asked. The chief says that's all a blind. Jack Lay did it to protect Robinson. They were both working together. I know it looks bad for Robinson, but I don't think it would hurt to give the towers another thorough search. I was the one who heard Jack Lay make the confession and I don't believe he was lying. I believe he was trying to tell me all he knew. Maybe. Maybe. I think he was too smart for you, Mr. Hardy, and everybody else thinks so too. It was all a hoax. I'll believe that after I've searched the towers inside and out. Well, go ahead. Go as far as you like. But I don't think you'll find that treasure. With that, Mr. Hardy was content. He made preparations for a search of the towers, although Adelia Applegate flatly declared that the detective was making a laughing stock of her and her brother and that if the nonsense continued she would leave Tower Mansion forever and carry out her oft-expressed intention of going to one of the South Sea Islands as a missionary. In spite of the protestations of the worthy lady, however, the search was carried out. The old tower was visited first, and for the greater part of the following morning the place was searched from top to bottom. Even the floors were torn up in places in the quest for some secret hiding place in which Jack Lay might have left the loot. But although Fenton Hardy, accompanied by the boys and Herd Applegate, who soon became infected with the dogged enthusiasm of the others and lent every assistance in his power, hunted throughout the old tower in every conceivable place, the missing jewels and bonds were not recovered. Nothing left but to search the new tower, Mr. Hardy commented briefly, when the search was over, and throughout the whole afternoon the new tower was the scene of a search that was as thorough as it was fruitless. Walls and partitions were tapped, floors were sounded, Furniture was minutely examined, not an inch of space escaped the minute scrutiny of the detective and his helpers. But as the search wore on and the loot still evaded discovery, the chagrin of Fenton Hardy deepened and heard Applegate finally lost his temper. A hoax, he declared. A hoax from start to finish. The man was in earnest, the detective insisted. Then where is the stuff? Someone else may have found it. That's the only explanation I can think of. Who else could have taken it but Robinson? To this, Mr. Hardy was silent. In spite of his knowledge of and liking for the man, he was beginning to suspect that the caretaker may have had a hand in the affair after all. Either that or Jack Lay simply told that yarn to shield Robinson, declared Applegate. I'm not going to give up this search yet said Mr. Hardy patiently. Perhaps the loot was hidden somewhere about the grounds. So the grounds of Tower Mansion, particularly in the vicinity of the two towers, were thoroughly searched. The shrubbery was inspected but to no avail. The search continued until sundown, and by that time Adelia Applegate was pale with wrath, for the place, as she expressed it, had been turned upside down. Heard Applegate was outspoken in his rage and disappointment, while Fenton Hardy was deeply chagrined. As for the boys, although they had expected that the additional search would be without success, they shared their father's bewilderment. I can't understand it, admitted the detective. I could have sworn that Jack Lay was in earnest when he made that confession. He knew he was near death and that he had nothing to gain by concealment. I can't understand it at all. And there the mystery remained, deeper than it had ever been. XX, the flash in the tower. For two days after the unsuccessful search of Tower Mansion, there were no further developments in the affair of the robbery. But on the third day, Chief Colleague took a hand. 
The first intimation the Hardy boys had of it was when they met Callie Shaw and Iola Morton on their way to school. Iola, a plump, dark girl, was a sister of Chet Morton and had achieved the honor of being about the only girl Joe Hardy had ever conceded to be anything but an unmitigated nuisance. Joe, who was shy in the presence of girls, professed a lofty scorn for all members of the other sex, particularly those of high school age, but had once grudgingly admitted that Iola Morton was all right, for a girl. This, from him, was high praise. Have you heard what's happened, asked Callie, as they met the boys near the school entrance. School called off for today, asked Joe eagerly. No, no. Nothing like that. It's about the Robinsons. What's happened now? Mr. Robinson has been arrested again. The Hardy boys stared at her as though thunderstruck. What for? demanded Frank, in astonishment. Over that robbery at Tower Mansion. He has been working in the city lately and chief colleague sent Detective Smuff for him last night. Iola and I were over to see the Robinson girls last night and they told us about it. Smuff should be back by now. Well, can you beat that, exclaimed Frank. I wonder what's the big idea of arresting him again. It seems the chief has an idea that Mr. Robinson was in league with this man Jack Lay, the man your father got the confession from. He told Mrs. Robinson last night that he was sure Mr. Robinson had the stuff hidden somewhere and that he was going to find out. He was perfectly mean and nasty about it, and Mrs. Robinson doesn't know what to do. The Hardy boys looked at one another. The affair had suddenly assumed more serious proportions. If Mr. Robinson is brought back, he'll lose his job, and he had a hard time getting it, anyway, said Iola. The worst of it is, said Frank slowly, that the case looks pretty bad against Mr. Robinson. You don't think they'll send him to the penitentiary? It looks bad. The thief said he hid the stuff in the old tower. When we looked for it, the stuff wasn't there. About the only person that could have found it and taken it away, was Mr. Robinson himself. He wouldn't do it, declared Iola indignantly. We're sure he wouldn't. But a jury mightn't be so easy to convince. It was time to go into school at that moment and they went to their classrooms, Frank and Joe deeply worried by what they had just heard. At recess that morning they met Jerry, Phil, Tony and Chet Morton, and told them the news. All the boys were highly concerned over this sudden turn in events. This will be tough on Perry, said Phil. It'll be tough on the whole family, Chet declared. They've had enough trouble over this dirty affair as it is. The boys discussed the situation from all angles and racked their brains for some way whereby they could help the Robinsons, but they were reluctantly forced to admit that only by actual discovery of the hidden loot could Mr. Robinson be cleared of suspicion in connection with the robbery. Even if he were tried and acquitted, it would be a stain on his reputation for the rest of his life, as long as the treasure isn't recovered, Frank summed up. We'll just have to wait and see what happens, Joe said. We've done all we could, and it hasn't been enough. And Dad has done the same. I'm sorry, on his account. He was so sure he had cleared the whole thing up when he got the confession from Jack Lay. But there was something lacking. Well, we all helped too, remarked Jerry. We kept Collig and Smuff from catching that train. Jack Lay wouldn't have talked at all if they had seen him. So, reluctantly enough, the boys were forced to admit that they were facing a stone wall. This also was the conclusion of Fenton Hardy, when they talked to him at lunch that day. There's nothing to be done, said the detective. Robinson has been arrested, and while he might be cleared by a skillful lawyer, he hasn't any money to spend on his defense. Whether he is cleared or not, his reputation is ruined. Unless the loot is found, put in Joe. Yes, unless the loot is found. That is his only hope. But I don't think there's much chance of that. And there the mystery of Tower Mansion rested for the time being. 
The arrest of Mr. Robinson furnished a sensation for a day or so and then the case receded into the background, the newspapers finding other things to become excited about. But for the Robinsons it was, naturally enough, a matter of supreme moment. Perry Robinson paid a call at the Hardy home, pleading with the great detective to continue his efforts to clear the accused man. Mr. Hardy was sympathetic, but, as he said, he was facing a stone wall. I've done all I can, my boy, he explained to the grief-stricken lad. If there was anything more I could do, I would do it. But there are no more clues. If Red Jackley's confession couldn't clear up the affair, then nothing else could. I'm afraid. He left the sentence unfinished. Do you mean my father will go to jail? I wouldn't say that. But you must be prepared to face the worst. He didn't do it, said Perry doggedly. I know you have confidence in him. But the law looks only at the facts. Many an innocent man has been convicted on less evidence. It will kill my mother. Mr. Hardy was silent. I don't know what to do, said Perry. I'd do anything to save him. But there's nothing. There is nothing any of us can do now unless by some lucky chance the loot is recovered. That would clear everything up, of course. But in the meantime we just have to wait and hope. And you can't do anything more, Mr. Hardy. A detective is not a miracle man, my boy, said Fenton Hardy kindly. He is only a man who is trained in tracing criminals. He has to go by the facts at his disposal. I have exhausted every line of action in this case. Everything that could be done, has been done. Perry Robinson got up, twisting his cap nervously in his hands. We all thank you very much too, Mr. Hardy, he said huskily. Don't think I've been ungrateful by coming here and asking you to do more. I guess I didn't realize just how hopeless it is. It isn't hopeless, exactly. Don't think that. There's always hope, you know. But be prepared for the worst. I'll have to be. With that, the boy left. Frank and Joe met him in the hallway and awkwardly tried to express their sympathy. Perry was grateful. I know both of you have done a lot for us in this mess, he said. If it hadn't been for you we wouldn't even have Jackley's story to go on. We're only sorry it didn't work out as we hoped, Perry, Frank said. We thought that would clear the whole thing up. Instead, it seems to have involved your father deeper than ever. It wasn't your fault. Perhaps something will turn up yet. Joe and I aren't going to lie down on the job now. There isn't much we can do, but we'll have our eyes open for more clues if there are any. Perry Robinson shrugged his shoulders dispiritedly. I guess there isn't much use now, he said. But I appreciate it of you. When he went away, the Hardy boys watched him going down the front walk. His carefree stride was gone, and instead he walked mechanically, as though in a daze. What a fine pair of detectives we are, exclaimed Frank, in sudden disgust. If we had been any good at all we could have got those clues soon enough for Dad to have caught Jack Lay in time. No use worrying about that now, replied his brother. It was just the way things happened. Well, there's one thing left. We must find that loot. Haven't we tried? Yes, but we can try some more. We've just got to clear Mr. Robinson. And there's only the one way. We must find the loot. It was a dull, gloomy day, indicative of rain, and this did not add to the boys' spirits. To ease their feelings the brothers took a walk, and quite unconsciously their steps took them in the vicinity of Tower Mansion. Let's have a squint at the old place from the outside, suggested Joe. Don't let Adelia see you, or she'll come after you with a broomstick, chuckled Frank. Gee, but she's a tartar. They walked into the grounds. 
It was growing darker now and they easily made their way among the trees and bushes to the vicinity of the rambling mansion. They gazed up at the old tower questioningly. Some puzzle, was Frank's comment. Will the case of the tower treasure ever be solved? Search me, was his brother's slangy answer. Perhaps, oh, Frank, look, he added suddenly. He was gazing at the upper windows of the old stone tower. He had seen a strange flash of light. Now this flash was followed by another. That's queer, muttered Frank. What can it mean? The light disappeared, then of a sudden it flashed out and downward in the direction of the lads. Must be looking for us, gasped Joe, and started to get behind a bush. It's Adelia, and she has a big flashlight, came, a moment later, from Frank. What do you know about that? She's looking for the treasure herself, cried Joe. Ha! Huh? And after all she said about our looking being nothing but foolishness. They saw the woman gaze out of the window for a few seconds. In one hand she held the flashlight. For a moment she turned the light into her own face, and the boys saw there a look of utter disgust. Didn't find it, I'll bet a cookie, chuckled Joe. Come on, let's get away before she spots us, returned his brother, and they were soon on their way. As they walked home, Joe and Frank talked the matter over. They smiled when they thought of the eccentric woman up in that dusty old tower, but their minds soon went back to Slim and the troubles of the Robinson family. We've got to find that loot, declared Frank emphatically. No matter where that tower treasure is, we've got to find it. Got to, but can we? We simply have to, I tell you. XXI, a new idea. A week passed, and still the loot was not recovered. Mr. Robinson had been held for trial at an early court session. The general opinion in Bayport was that he would be sentenced to imprisonment. The fact that he still refused to tell where he had got the $900 so near the time of the robbery, weighed heavily against him. Fenton Hardy was downcast. It was the first case of its kind that he had been unsuccessful in solving completely, and although he was satisfied that he had done good work in tracking down Red Jack Lay and getting the confession, the result had scarcely been worth the effort. Chief Colleague and Detective Smuff were complacent. They made no effort to conceal their critical opinions of the great detective, who had taken so much time trying to solve the mystery when the real thief was right under his nose all the time. I told you so, was the burden of Chief Colleague's song of triumph. I knew all the time that Robinson was the man. I arrested him right after the robbery, but they all said it couldn't be him. So I let him go. But I knew all the time it couldn't be anyone else. Ain't that so, Smuff? And the loyal Smuff would dutifully chime in with, Yes, Chief. We have to hand it to you. You had the right man all the time. I guess these professional detectives won't think they're so smart after all, eh, Smuff? No, you bet they won't. We can still teach them a thing or two. I'll say we can, Smuff. I'll say we can. These stories, naturally enough, reached the ears of Fenton Hardy and the Hardy boys and they felt keenly the arrogant superiority displayed by the Bayport police officials. But they said nothing, suffering their defeat in silence. On the following Saturday, Frank and Joe decided to take an outing. I want to get out of this city for a few hours, said Frank. We've been so busy worrying about the Tower Mansion case that we've forgotten how to play. Let's take the motorbikes and go out for a run. Good idea, his brother replied. Mother will make us up some lunch. Mrs. Hardy, who was in the kitchen with the cook, smiled when they made known their request. Fair-haired and gentle, she had been tolerantly amused by her son's activities in the Tower Affair, but she was glad to see them return to their boyish ways. You'll be getting too grown up altogether, she had said to them a few days previously. And now, when they said they were going on a day's outing with the motorcycles, 
she hastened to prepare a substantial lunch for them. We'll be back in time for supper, mother, Frank promised. We're just going to follow the highway along the railroad. After that we may cut across country to Chet's place, and then home. Take care of yourself, she warned. No speeding. We'll be careful, they promised, as Joe stowed the lunch basket on the carrier of his machine. Then, with a sputtering roar, the motorcycles sped out along the driveway and soon the boys were on the concrete highway leading out of the city. In a short time they had reached the outskirts of Bayport, and then they turned west onto the state highway that ran parallel to the railway tracks. It was a bright, sunny spring morning, and the highway was not congested with traffic. Freight trains shunted back and forth on the railway tracks below the embankment, and now and then a passenger train steamed by, trailing a cloud of black smoke. Like most boys, Frank and Joe could not help but feel the fascination of the railway, although they admitted that they preferred the comparative freedom of their own motorcycles, which were not bound to follow the steel rails and did not have to obey the beck and call of dispatchers. Out in the open country they put on a little more speed. The highway was like a city pavement beneath them and the cool breeze stung the colour into their cheeks. For more than two hours they rode, passing through villages and small towns, until at last they came to a point where another railway intersected the line they had been following. Here, a road also ran parallel to the tracks, branching off the main highway. Always on the alert for new country to explore, the hardy boys decided to follow this side road. It's off the main stream of traffic, said Frank, and the country seems to be wooded farther on. We can have lunch in the shade of some trees. This appeared to be an advantage, for there were no trees along the state road, and the constant stream of vehicles made a roadside lunch something of a public affair. Accordingly, the boys turned their motorcycles down the side road which, although it was not paved, was well graded, and led through a quieter countryside. What railroad is this, anyway? asked Frank, as they sped along. The Bayport and Coast Line. It's mostly freight. The Bayport and Coast. Why, that's the railway that Red Jack Lay used to work for. Don't you remember Dad telling us that? His first crime was stealing freight from the road. So he did. I'd forgotten all about it. The boys looked down at the tracks below the embankment with renewed interest, by virtue of the railway's association with the notorious criminal. Mention of Jackley's name revived recollections of the Tower Mansion case, and when the boys finally decided to stop in the shade of a little grove of trees beside the road for lunch, they reviewed every incident of the mysterious affair. It would have been better for everyone if Jackley had stayed with the railway, Frank observed as he bit into a thick roast beef sandwich. He sure caused a lot of trouble before he died. And he has caused even more since, by the looks of things. The Robinsons will remember his name for a long time to come. I wonder if Mr. Robinson really was in league with him, Frank. I don't think so. And I don't believe Mr. Robinson ever found that treasure after the robbery, either. There is some explanation to this whole affair that none has been able to fathom. If I remember rightly, it was in this part of the country that Jack Lay worked. That's what Dad told us. He said it was along the right of way near the state road. Jack Lay was a section hand or signalman, or something. Both boys gazed down the two lines of railway tracks that gleamed in the sun. Far into the distance, the glittering bands of steel extended, vanishing into a common perspective. The land along the right of way was thickly wooded. It was an attractive part of the country and here and there the wooded spaces were broken by green fields and meadows. The boys were at the top of a slope, and they had a view of a wide expanse of country below them. In the far distance, along the tracks, they could see a little red railway station, and back of that the roofs and spires of a village. Nearer still they could see the spindly legs and squat bulk of a water tank, painted a bright scarlet. This water tank was not far from the railway station, but half a mile down the track, 
and only a few hundred yards from the place where the Hardy Boys were seated, rose the bulk of another water station. But this tower, one of the old style built before the modern tanks came into use, was not freshly painted. It had been allowed to fall into a state of disrepair. Some of the rungs were missing from the ladder that led up the side, and the tower itself had a forlorn and weather-beaten aspect, as though it had been deserted. This, indeed, was the case. The new tower tank closer to the station had been erected to replace it, and although the old structure had not been torn down, it was not now used. Frank took a huge bite out of his sandwich and began to munch it thoughtfully. The sight of the two water stations had given him an idea, but at first it seemed to him to be too absurd for consideration. He was wondering whether he should mention it to his brother. Then he noticed that Joe, too, was gazing thoughtfully down the railway tracks. Joe raised a sandwich to his lips absently, essayed a bite and missed the sandwich altogether. Still he continued gazing at the two water towers. Finally Joe turned and looked at his brother. In the eyes of both was the light of a great discovery. They knew that they were both thinking of the same thing. Two water towers, said Frank slowly. An old one and a new one. And Jack Lay said. He hid the stuff in the old tower. He was a railway man. Why not? shouted Joe, springing to his feet. Why couldn't it have been the old water tower? He used to work around here. He didn't say the old tower of Tower Mansion, after all. He just said the old tower. Frank, I believe we've stumbled on the clue. It would be the natural thing for him to come to his old haunts after the robbery. And if he found he couldn't get away with the stuff he would hide it somewhere he knew. The old water tower. Why didn't we think of it before, Joe? Why, that must be the place. XXI, the search. Lunch, motorcycles, everything else was forgotten. With a wild yell of delight, Frank began to scurry down the embankment that flanked the right of way. At his heels ran Joe. They raced down the grassy slope until they came to the wire fence. They scrambled over it, heedless of tearing their clothes. They dashed up onto the cinder path beside the rails. What if we're wrong, Frank, panted Joe. We can't be wrong. I just know that's what Jack Lay meant. The old tower. It was the old water tower he meant all along. He didn't have time to explain. The Hardy Boys were tingling with excitement. It seemed that they could never reach the water tower. They dashed along the cinder path with all the speed at their command, but the tower still seemed a long distance away. If only we have stumbled on the secret after all, Joe. It'll clear Mr. Robinson. We'll get the reward. Dad'll be proud of us. These thoughts gave them new strength and their hopes were high as they neared the tower. The structure reared gloomily from beside the tracks. At close quarters it was even more decrepit, even more in a state of disrepair than they had imagined. The old tower had been abandoned for some time in favor of the new tank nearer the station. It sagged perilously. The ladder that led to the top lacked so many rungs that at first the boys feared they would be unable to ascend. If Jack Lay got up this ladder, we can do the same, said Frank, as he stopped, panting, at the bottom. Let's go. He began to scramble up the flimsy ladder. Hardly had he ascended for rungs than there came an alarming crack. Look out! Frank clung to the rung above, just as a rung snapped beneath his weight. He hung in midair for a moment, then drew up his feet and placed them on the next rung. This proved firmer, and he was able to go on. Don't break em all, called Joe. I want to be in on this. Frank continued up the ladder. Occasionally, when he came to a place where a rung had broken off, he was obliged to haul himself upward by main force, but finally he neared the top. 
The ladder ran up along the side of the tank to the very top of the great, vat-like receptacle, and there it led to a trap door. The hardy boys did not look down. They were high above the ground now, and the old water tower was swaying alarmingly. They began to realize their peril, for the tower was old and liable to topple over with them. But the thought did not serve to restrain them, and at last Frank scrambled over the last rung and found himself on the upper surface of the tower. He turned around and helped Joe over. Far below them lay the countryside, the green fields laid out in neat patterns, the roads in the distance like white ribbons, and the railway tracks glistening in the sunlight. The wind seemed much stronger on top of the tower, and it whistled about their ears. The flimsy structure swayed to and fro with every movement they made. The trapdoor was closed. Frank went over to it and tugged at it, but the timber was heavy and Joe was obliged to help him. Between the two, however, they managed to raise it, revealing a dark gap that led into the recesses of the abandoned water tower. The upper part of the tank was a space about four feet in depth and separated from the lower, or main portion by a thick floor. Frank lowered himself through the opening, and he was quickly followed by his brother. They crouched down below the roof of the tank and peered about them in the obscurity. It must be in here. There's no other place he could have hidden the stuff, said Frank. Let's hunt for it, then. I wish we had brought our flashlights. Frank, however, had matches. Cautiously, he lit one. Then, crawling on hands and knees, he advanced into the darkness of the tower. In the faint glow of the match they saw that the place was half filled with rubbish. There was a quantity of old lumber, miscellaneous bits of iron, battered tin pails, crowbars, and other things piled up pell-mell in all parts of the tower. But there was no sign of hidden loot. It must be here somewhere, declared Joe doggedly. He wouldn't leave it out in the open. Probably it's in behind all this junk. Frank held the match. They had to be careful, for the place was as dry as tinder and any negligence might have made the whole place a mass of flame from which there would have been no escape. In the glow, then, Joe searched frantically, casting the old pails and the old bits of board and lumber aside with reckless abandon. One entire side of the tower top was searched without result. Then, on the far side, they spied a number of boards piled up in a peculiar manner. They did not look as though they had been flung there carelessly or accidentally, but rather as though they had been placed to hide something. Like a terrier after a bone, Joe made for it. Frantically, he tore away the boards. There, in a neat little hiding place formed by the wood, lay a bag. It was an ordinary gunny sack, but when Joe dragged it forth he knew at once that their search had ended. We've found it, he exulted. The tower treasure. This must be it. Joe dragged the gunny sack out into the light beneath the trap door. They did not even wait to go out on top of the water tower. Hurry, exclaimed Frank, as with trembling fingers Joe began to open the sack. It was tied with a piece of twine, and Joe tugged at the stubborn knots. At last, however, the twine fell away, and the bag sagged open. Joe plunged his hand into the recesses of the sack and he first withdrew an old-fashioned bracelet of precious stones. Jewelry. How about the bonds? Again Joe groped into the sack. His fingers encountered a bulky packet. He withdrew it and the packet proved to be comprised of long, imposing-looking documents, held together by a rubber band. On the surface of the outer document, when they held it up to the light, they read the information that it was a negotiable bond for $5,000 issued by the city of Bayport. That settles it, said Frank. We've found the treasure. The boys looked at one another in triumph. Jack Lay wasn't lying after all. He did hide the stuff in the old tower. And Mr. Robinson wasn't in league with him and didn't find it after it was hidden, ruminated Joe. We can clear up the whole affair now. Let's start, then. 
Frank exclaimed. No use sitting here all day patting ourselves on the back. It's up to us to get right back to Bayport and turn this treasure over to the Applegates. Hastily, he scrambled up through the trap, and Joe passed the bag of treasure up to him. Frank put the sack carefully to one side, then helped his brother up to the top of the tower. After that he tied the treasure sack to his belt, in order that he might have the full use of his two hands in descending the precarious ladder. They were so excited by their momentous discovery, by the knowledge that all the days of fruitless search had now ended, that they descended the ladder at breakneck speed. The last two rungs of the ladder snapped under Frank's feet and the boys were obliged to undertake a drop of six feet in order to reach the ground, but they hardly noticed it. Scarcely had they picked themselves up than they were off on a run for their motorcycles, parked far back on the hillside. We've shown M, A, eh? gasped Joe. I'll say we have. Oh boy, won't this surprise everybody. Now I'd like to see Dad tell us we're not cut out to be detectives. Wait till Adelia Applegate sees all her jewellery back again. She'll change her opinion of us. Wait till Herd Applegate sees his bonds back. And wait till Chief Colleague and Detective Smuff hear about it. So the Hardy boys gloated over their prospective return, but beneath it all they were thinking of what this discovery meant to the Robinsons. They reached the embankment, scrambled over the fence, and made their way up the slope until at last they regained their motorcycles. Although they had only partly finished their lunch, they were too excited to eat any more, so they stowed the remainder away in the basket, lashed the bag of treasure securely to Frank's carrier, and turned the motorcycles around. What a lucky chance for us that we decided to go down this road, declared Frank. If we had done as we intended and circled around by Chet's place we would never have found the stuff. And it's ten chances to one that neither of us would have thought of that water tower until his dying day. The rest of their speculations were drowned by the roar of the motorcycles as the Hardy boys set out on their return to Bayport with the tower treasure. 23. Adelia Applegate's Compliment The curtain rolled down on the mystery of the tower treasure that afternoon in the library of the Applegate home. The Hardy boys had gone directly to their father with the story of the recovery of the loot, and Fenton Hardy had lost no time in acquainting Herd Applegate with the facts. Between them, they arranged a little surprise for Chief Colleague and Detective Smuff, as well as for Henry Robinson. On the invitation of Herd Applegate, the chief brought Mr. Robinson to Tower Mansion, to be faced with additional evidence, as Fenton Hardy suavely put it. Chief Colleague and Detective Smuff entered the library with their prisoner between them. They had confidently anticipated that Mr. Applegate had discovered some new facts that would further serve to tighten the web about the unfortunate caretaker, and when they came into the room there was nothing at first to eradicate this impression. Herd Applegate and Adelia Applegate sat by the huge library table, and with them were Mr. Hardy and his sons. Chief Colleague did not at first notice the gunny sack lying on the table. Well, Mr. Applegate, said the chief, fanning himself, as usual, with his hat. I brought along Mr. Robinson, just as you asked. Good. As I mentioned to you, there has been some new evidence in this case. I knew something would turn up, grunted Smuff. Not that any new evidence is needed, of course, declared the chief. We got this fellow dead to rights, as it is. He ain't got a chance in the world. But still, it's just as good to make a real strong case of it. I'm afraid you don't understand me, went on Herd Applegate. This new evidence will clear Mr. Robinson. And when he is cleared, I want him back in my employ again. Ha! Huh? gasped Chief Colleague. What's that you say? exclaimed Smuff. The stolen stuff has been found. No. Here it is, put in Fenton Hardy, getting up and dumping the gunny sack upside down on the table. There was a tinkle and clatter as jewels came rolling out on the table and then there was a rustle of paper as the packets of bonds followed. 
Where was it found? asked the chief. This doesn't clear him. He probably hid it someplace. The stuff was found just where Jack Lay said he hid it. In the old tower. But the old tower was searched high and low. There is more than one old tower, went on Mr. Hardy. Only we didn't happen to think of that at the time. It was found in the old water tower, down at the junction, where Jack Lay used to work. Chief Collig was speechless with surprise. He gazed at Smuff, whose jaw had dropped in astonishment. Who found it? asked Smuff at last. These two lads, said Mr. Applegate, indicating the Hardy boys. They found it this morning. Them kids, scoffed Chief Colleague. I don't believe it. Well, there's the stuff to prove it, snapped Fenton Hardy. I've got my jewellery back, thanks to them, declared Adelia Applegate shrilly. They were smarter than the whole pack of you. If it wasn't for them, the stuff would never have been found. And I was the one who didn't want to let them search the old tower and who spoke crossly to them. Why, they're real detectives, both of them. In all the talk and excitement that followed the clearing up of the tower mystery, the Hardy boys received no compliment that they treasured so much as that remark of Adelia Applegate's. Well, said Chief Colleague, scratching his head, I'll be bumped. He looked at Smuff. I'll be bumped, too, declared Smuff. This beats all, said the chief. It does, agreed his faithful satellite. Shut up, snapped the chief. Who asked you to say anything? Nobody. Well, then, keep quiet. A fine detective you are. Why didn't you think of that? The old tower? Of course he meant the old water tower. What else could he have meant? But you wouldn't think of it. Not in a hundred years you wouldn't think of it. What kind of a detective are you, anyway? Here was a case that was as simple as ABC and you couldn't think of it. You let yourself be beat by a couple of boys. Smuff looked properly ashamed of himself although it was plain that he was struggling with the temptation to ask the chief why he had not thought of the water tower, too. But he stifled the impulse and thereby doubtless saved the chief the trouble of dismissing him for impudence and insubordination. Yes, said Herd Applegate, the Hardy boys recovered the treasure. And I think you will admit that Mr. Robinson is cleared. Personally, I am satisfied that he knew nothing whatever of the theft and I want to apologize to him for any unjust suspicions I may have had. Mr. Robinson, will you let me shake your hand? Trembling, Henry Robinson stepped forward. His face had been illuminated by a glow of incredulous hope from the moment he learned of the discovery of the loot. Am I really cleared? he asked. I knew things looked bad against me all along. I hardly dared hope. I guess you'll be let off now all right, said Chief Collig grudgingly. There will be formalities, of course, said Fenton Hardy. But I'm pretty sure the prosecution won't continue. The discovery of this loot proves Red Jackley's story was correct from start to finish. But how about that $900, demanded Smuff suspiciously. Mr. Robinson straightened up. I'm sorry, he said, but even yet I can't explain that. I can in a few days, perhaps, but I've promised to keep silent about that money. It's a private matter entirely. I don't think we need bother about that, objected Herd Applegate. I've checked over the treasure and it's all there. All the bonds and all the jewellery. There is nothing missing. As for the $900, why, that is Mr. Robinson's own affair. Reluctantly, Smuff subsided into silence. Will you come back into my employ, Mr. Robinson, asked Herd Applegate. Of course, I feel very keenly, because you were unjustly accused, and I want to make it up to you. If you will consent to come back to Tower Mansion as caretaker again I will increase your salary, 
and I'll also insist that you accept back pay for the time you were away. Why, stammered Mr. Robinson, this is good of you, Mr. Applegate. Of course I'll come back, I'll be glad to. It'll mean a lot to my wife and daughters, and to Perry. He'll be able to go back to school again. Good, exclaimed Joe Hardy impulsively, slapping his knee. Then, finding that he had attracted attention to himself, he sank back into his chair, embarrassed. And as for the Hardy boys, proceeded Herd Applegate, seeing they discovered the treasure. Real detectives, shrilled Adelia. Real detectives, both of them. Smart lads. Yes, they showed some real detective work, and I hope they grow up to follow in their father's footsteps. But, as I was saying, they discovered the treasure, so of course they will get the reward. A thousand bucks, exclaimed Detective Smuff, in awe. Dollars, Mr. Smuff, dollars, corrected Adelia Applegate severely. No slang please, not in Tower Mansion. One thousand iron men, declared Smuff, unheeding. One thousand round, fat, juicy smackers for a couple of kids. And a real detective like me. The thought was too much for him. He sank his head in his hands and groaned aloud. Frank and Joe did not dare look at each other. They were finding it difficult enough to restrain their laughter without that. Yes, a thousand dollars, went on Herd Applegate. I'll write the checks now. Five hundred for each. With that he took out his fountain pen, reached in a drawer of the table for a checkbook, and soon the silence was broken by the scratching of pen on paper. Herd Applegate wrote out two checks, each for five hundred dollars and these he handed to the boys. Frank and Joe accepted them with thanks, folded them up and put them in their pockets. And that, I think, concluded Mr. Applegate, finishes the mystery of the tower robbery. Thanks to the Hardy boys, chimed in his sister. Real detectives, both of them. I must ask them up for supper some night. Xiv, the last of the tower case. The discovery of the tower mansion treasure was a Bayport sensation for almost a week, and a week is a long time for any sensation to last, even in Bayport. People said that they knew all along that Mr. Robinson was innocent of the theft, and went as far out of their way to be nice to him as they had gone out of their way to be unkind to him and ignore him when he was accused of crime. People too, were loud in their praises of the Hardy Boys, and everybody predicted a bright future for them and said they knew all along that the lads were bound to solve the mystery if they kept at it long enough. All of this the boys took with a grain of salt, as the saying is, for they knew that the public is fickle and as quick to condemn failure as it is to praise success. Frank and Joe did not let the adulation turn their heads. When we couldn't find the treasure everybody said we were just nuisances, little boys trying to play detective, laughed Frank. Now that we have found it, all that is forgotten. The main thing is that we've proved to Dad that we know how to keep our eyes and ears open. And we've got a thousand dollars between us. A mighty nice start for a bank account. I'll say it is. I wish another mystery would come along. We can't expect to get a reward for every case we work on, and we can't expect to solve them all, either, Frank pointed out. We can't expect to get many cases to try our hand at. We're not professionals just yet. No, but we will be, someday. This conversation took place as the Hardy boys were on their way up to Tower Mansion about a week later. Adelia Applegate, who had taken a great fancy to the lads, in violent contrast to her dislike of them on the day they had gone to make a search of the old tower, had invited them up to the Tower Mansion for supper. She had also asked them to invite a number of their chums. So Slim Robinson, Chet Morton, Biff Hooper, Jerry Gilroy, Phil Cohen and Tony Preto had all been invited by the brothers to attend. When the Hardy boys reached the mansion they found that the others had already arrived. We're waiting for you, shrilled Miss Applegate, who was decked out in an ancient yellow gown with remarkable trimmings of black and red. 
Everybody's hungry. She soon led the way to the dining room, where a long table had been prepared for the boys. They gasped when they saw that array, and Miss Applegate beamed. I know you don't want an old woman like me watching you while you eat, she cried. So go right ahead and put your elbows on the table if you wish. There was a scramble for places, as a servant came in with the soup, but Frank Hardy sprang to his feet. Three cheers for Miss Applegate. They were given with vociferous enthusiasm. Miss Applegate blushed with pleasure, and as she left the room the Hardy boys and their chums were sitting down to a banquet the like of which they had never seen before. For more than half an hour they indulged in roast chicken, crisp and brown, huge helpings of fluffy mashed potatoes, pickles, vegetables, and salads, pies and puddings to suit every taste, and when the last boy sank back in his chair with a happy sigh there was still food to spare. I never thought I'd see the day when I'd quit eating while there was still some chicken on the table, murmured Chet Morton, but this is the day. We have the Hardy Boys to thank for this spread, said Jerry. Let's give them three cheers. The boys roared out their hip, hip, hurrah, three times, while Joe and Frank looked acutely uncomfortable. They looked still more uncomfortable when Slim Robinson got up, pushing back his chair. I'd like to say something, fellows, if you don't mind. Three cheers for Slim, yelled someone. So the boys gave Slim three cheers, and he gulped and blushed crimson. Speech. The cry was taken up. Speech. Speech. I'm not going to make any speech, he said. I only want to say something. Go ahead. I'm not going to hand out any compliments to the Hardy boys. Joe and Frank looked greatly relieved. They had been afraid of being embarrassed by Slim's gratitude. Everybody knows what they've done and everybody knows what it means to me and to my family. You bet. Sure. But I just wanted to clear up one point on behalf of my father. Three cheers for Henry Robinson. He's all right. The three cheers for Mr. Robinson were perhaps a little weaker than the others, but that was only because some of the boys were beginning to show slight signs of hoarseness by that time. It's about the $900 that he got just about the time of the robbery. He couldn't explain it at the time and it looked bad against him. It doesn't matter where he got it, shouted Biff Hipper. I'll bet he got it honestly anyway, and if anyone else says different, just let him come outside. No one else said differently. Yes, he got it honestly, of course, said Slim. The money was paid him by a man who owed it to him. But Dad couldn't say anything about it because he promised not to. This man owed two other men besides my father, and those debts should have been paid first. He was afraid the others would sue him if they heard he had paid Dad, so he made my father promise to say nothing. And when my dad makes a promise he keeps it. The boys looked at one another. To tell the truth, few of them had thought of the affair of the $900, but now that it was recalled to them they realized that here was the final angle of the Tower Mansion mystery cleared up at last. They cheered Slim to the echo, they pounded on the table with their knives, and when Herd Applegate came in to see what the racket was about they gave him three cheers and made him sit at the head of the table. And that ended the affair of Tower Mansion but it did not end the career of the Hardy Boys as amateur detectives. They were soon to be called on to help solve another mystery, and the story of their adventures in this case will be told in the next volume of this series, entitled The Hardy Boys, The House on the Cliff. Speech. Speech, the boys were shouting to Herd Applegate. The old stamp collector got up, smiling. It's been a long time since there's been a crowd of boys in Tower Mansion, he said. I've been in danger of forgetting that I was ever young once myself. So I want you to come back often. I want you to know that Tower Mansion is always open to the Hardy Boys and their chums. The Hardy Boys looked at one another, as the crowd about the table broke into a yell of delight. 
He's a pretty good old scout after all, isn't he, said Frank. You bet he is, replied his brother. The end.